So welcome everyone. I'm actually going to start us off uh, and I'll be the introduction before the introduction with Joan. So uh, if you don't know me, uh, my name is Dimitri Reyes and I'm the marketing and communications director at Cabin Carey Press. And I'm wishing everyone here health, happiness and safety this evening as you join us for 20 years of publishing as an indie press. In a moment, you'll be hearing from the creator of it all, the queen of this castle that we call Cabin Carey, Joan Cusack Handler. But I wanted to mention a couple of things about the evening. First off, uh, we are showered with the gratitude for everyone that is here for sending in testimonials, recorded music, poems, and other film that you're going to be seeing this evening. Uh, all of you that are in attendance or are participating, uh, you are what makes everything that we do possible. This is why we do it. Uh, so although we can't see you at, or see you in the chat or hear you in the chat, we do want to feel your energies. So secondly, we're gonna hear from over 40 voices this evening, all from different parts of the country, uh, speaking about different subjects and themes. So just keep that in mind uh, that we are a press of the everyday and we do our due diligence to reach a general audience. Lastly, throughout the evening, uh, you have a closed captioning tab. You can check at the bottom. We have a closed captioner with us this evening. So if you're a Netflix person that likes to Netflix or Hulu with the closed captions, all you have to do is press the CC down below and you will be able to get an annotated uh, version of our presentation. So you can actually feel it in many different ways. So again, thank you. And without further ado, I am going to introduce everyone to Joan Cusack Handler. So Joan, whenever you're ready. Good to see you all. Uh, as most of you know, I'm Joan Cusack Handler, and I am the founder and publisher of Cabin Carey Press um, and the co-editor co with Gabriel Cleveland of Places We Return to, uh, selections from each of our 20, 104 books that we published over the past 20 years. Named for the two counties in Ireland where my parents were raised, Cavan Kerry from the outset has been committed to a dual mission. Our artistic art and community. Our artistic mission champions poetry and prose, which explore the emotional and psychological aspects of human experience. In short, art that reflects our tagline, lives brought to life, and which focuses on the exploration of everyday life in what Robert Frost termed the music of everyday speech. On the community side, we commit to bring this art to a general readership and to underserved populations where they live, work, and receive services. One might say that our goal is to produce art that is no longer geared to, quotes, the academy, but art that emanates from the streets and neighborhoods. And today we celebrate Kevin Carey's hard work and success. I'm delighted to be with you today, albeit virtually. This is hardly the celebration we planned. Our hope was to be together with you in person, but COVID decided otherwise. And Dimitri just mentioned some of the, the, um, the pluses of doing an event virtually. There are many of you here that could not have been here if um, we were doing it in person. So we won't complain. Um, that said, I'm, so, I'm delighted that you're here to celebrate Cabin Carey's 20th anniversary with us, the board of directors and advisors and the Cabin Carey staff. We have lots of activities planned for today's party, including music, readings, and comments from writers and friends. This afternoon's theme is gratitude. Gratitude first to our writers who entrusted their manuscripts to us 
to publish them with the highest degree of attention and expertise from editing to design to production such that they became the finest frame for the fine work they hold. Without our writers, Cavan Carey would not be the star that she is. Our press is only as strong as the works she publishes and our authors among the finest writing today. We salute them. And we bow in humility and thanks to our beloved first managing editor, Florence Eisman, the first person I hired to work beside me as I set out to bring life to this fledgling idea. A poet herself, Florence was multi-talented, intelligent and extremely capable and my partner in running this press for its first 13 years. We miss her, her wisdom, her generous laugh, her signature red lipstick. Gratitude also goes to Cavan Carey poet, Susan Jackson, whose gift in honor of her mother provided the support Cavan Carey needed to produce this commemorative anthology places we return to. Thank you to all of our generous friends who contribute, who continue to support our work, both our publishing work and our community programs, which expand the reach of fine poetry and prose. At the head of that line, thank you to my husband, Alan Handler, who provided the seed money for me to start this press. Thank you to our amazing staff, Gabriel C Cleveland, Managing Editor, Dimitri Reyes, Marketing and Communications Director, Jonathan Spinner, Development Director and Board Liaison, and Elena Neo, our Social Media Assistant. And special thanks goes to Gabriel Cleveland as co-editor of Places We Return To, and Dimitri Reyes, the technological wizard who orchestrated today's program. As many of you know, I've been tempted over the years to retire and hand this press over to young, talented people who would bring it successfully into its next phase of development. Young, adulthood. Well, I hired that staff, but I couldn't retire. The prospect of working with such committed and professional young people was too enticing to let go. So I haven't. Why would I? I learn from and am inspired by them every day. Thank you to our boards, both governors and advisors, our ambassadors in the world, both the literary sphere and the world at large. They spread the word about Cavan Carey's mission and work across communities, businesses, ethnicities, ages, and cultures. Thank you to you, our guests, who are offering your Sunday afternoon to share this festive occasion with us. It is our pleasure to have your company. And now it's my pleasure to introduce you to a great friend of Kevin Carey's, Afa Michael Weaver, a renowned and gifted poet and a person who has been involved with us and committed to us from day one. Um, Afa has been part of, was part of the original board of directors for several years and then moved to the board of advisors until today. Um, he is with us and we are delighted to have him um, today and all days. Thank you. Please welcome Afa Michael Weaver. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am delighted to be here to speak, uh, to celebrate 
the publication of 100 books by Cobham Carey Press. I have been a friend of the press and have known Joan Handler for quite a long time. And uh, it is just so wonderful to see books being published that celebrate the imagination, the memory, the truthfulness, the hopefulness of creative writing. And to make that work available in places where it might not ordinarily be available. And in the time of this pandemic, which is related in my mind and the mind of many others to the climate crisis that we face, the crisis of social racial justice, the tremendous changes that the world is going through. I see creative writing, the creative mind is essential to problem solving and Carlin Carey is right there and the most important part of the engine for change and the engine for positive growth in human society. So I'm just really delighted that the press has grown this way. And I look forward to many more years of growth, publication, and bringing joy to writers because we like to be published, don't we? And uh, so congratulations to the press. Thank you, Joan, and your family. Um, and thank you all you writers out there who struggle with doing whatever has to be done in order to make the time and space to write. And let me close by reading a poem of my own from my most recent collection, Spirit Boxing, from the University of Pittsburgh Press. John Henry sleeping in high grass. Mowers miles away, mud flies on top his hammer like they own it, his chest cresting and falling in shapes shifting between sunlight and leaves. Black steel, his destiny. John is motion at rest. Tides of moon and waves and still waters. Suns igniting hearts of molten iron. A cardened conviction, rose petals in rain. Sleep is a dream. The real world a poundage. Work a sentence for being his mama's son. The hammer in his crib, the supernatural a drum song of woodpeckers, cowbells in the field, heaven a home going back to a place before the bugle call to be born. Congratulations, Coven Carey Press, and thank you, Joan. Bye-bye. <coughs> <coughs> The Tobin Bridge for Pam. I have friends who are afraid of crossing bridges. It panics them to drive with the world spreading out on either side of them. I know this fear. Like so many of my own, it is linked to the worst of our imagination. I have a recurring dream about driving on a suspended bridge, arched with a deck over the ocean. The more I drive in the dream, the steeper it gets until my car is almost upside down. And always, just before it flips, I wake. I'm reminded of that dream today, crossing the Sagamore to Cape Cod, still numb from the image back home our friend Pam standing against the dark and stepping into nothingness. After we heard, we lay in bed remembering as if she'd been gone for years, the trip we took to Ireland, her loaded down with shopping bags and Glen Gareth, the kind way she had with our kids, her love affair with the Red Sox. My wife helped her so often over the years and I remember getting exasperated once when I was told of another episode, not because I wasn't sympathetic, but because I was frightened. I remember thinking, that could be me. We're all so close to it, aren't we? Clinging to that tenuous support, that bridge to sanity that keeps us suspended over what could be. This is how I see it. 
She is flying, not falling. The lights of downtown Boston are reflecting in the soft snowfall. Her eyes are closed. The hum of the traffic has faded. Her arms, like wings, lift her over the harbor. And in that moment, she knows much more than we know. and I'm honored to be participating tonight. Um, my poem that I'm reading is called Yop, and it's from A Bloom in a Rye. Read this love letter to life. Its pages turn in the ice fling off the fast car's roof. Follow the traveling carillon, the communism of the gospels, the ice rink's joyful fourfold spotlight, how it shines the hair and adds grace. Eyes and words swerve into focus. Nouns marry in metaphor. Lines enter a stranger's memory and stay for seven years. Smell the multiflora roses, honeysuckle, burning leaves. Feel the inside of the body, the smooth core. Watch the wren pull the dead fledgling from the hole, feather by dusty feather. Guess the stories, tailless squirrel on the wood pile, condom under the old folks home sofa, the lady's internal monologue as she guards the Lamborghini at the auto show, red guts spilt like berries from rabbit mouth. I'd write, even if each page's only destination were the stove for winter heat again and again. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lynn Andrews. I'm going to be reading Bathing in Your Brother's Bath Water from my book, Southern Comfort. Bathing, Miss D'Angelo informed us in health class, is very important, especially once you become a teenager. In fact, I can spell many of you this very day. So I advise every one of you girls to go home and take a good long bath tonight. I know some of your folks like to skimp on water, but consider it homework. Say Miss D'Angelo assigned it to you. But girls, let me warn you, never take a bath in the same water as your teenage brother. Why? Well, picture this. All those tiny bubbles settling on your legs when you sit in a nice tub of water. If you could count every itty bitty bubble, that would be only a fraction of how many sperm stream from a single man. Even if he doesn't touch himself, the water does. And it only takes one, one fast moving whip tailed sperm. And you know how easy it is to catch a cold how quickly that little virus races clear through you. And once that happens, no one will believe you're any Virgin Mary, no matter what you say. This excerpt is from Primary Lessons, a memoir published by Cavan Carey Press. It describes my debutante cotillion in Sumter, South Carolina in 1963. When we arrive at Lincoln High School, mama goes through the main door into the gymnasium. Butch blows me a kiss before he follows her to the gym to await my official arrival. I'm ushered through a side entrance into the girls' locker room where 11 other girls in a wide array of rustling white gowns, elbow length gloves and tiaras primp in front of the mirrors. We ooh and ah over each other's dresses, giddy with excitement and nervousness. I just hope I don't fall down the stairs when they call my name, says one girl. Everyone laughs, but I have the same fear. 
even though we practice negotiating the six steps down from the platform where we will stand while they call our names and read a statement about us. When Mrs. McCain announces that they're ready to present us, we get in line and march into the gymnasium. I suddenly get chills and begin to shake. At the back entrance, we're each handed a bouquet of red carnations tied with a wide red streamer that dangles below it. My bouquet dances in my hands. We can hear the rhythms of the live band playing, but the guests are hidden from our view by the large stage that's been built to serve as our launching pad. One by one, Mrs. McCain sends us up the back stairs onto the platform where we are to stand in the spotlight beneath a wooden trellis covered in red carnations. When it's my turn, she touches my shoulder and says, good luck. As I step into the spotlight, a warmth comes over me and my butterflies disappear. I lift my chin and stand tall, unmindful of mama's frequent warning that the tallest tree always attracts lightning. This night, I feel invincible. I smile as Mrs. McCain has told us to do, but I couldn't have done anything else even if I wanted to. I'm so happy, I feel as if I could float down those six steps. A voice over the loudspeaker says, ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to present Miss Sarah Marie White, the youngest daughter of Roberta Bracey White and William Edward White. Flashbulbs pop as Mr. E.C. Jones, the local black photographer, snaps pictures from his perch high up on a ladder. I'm ecstatic this moment is being commemorated. The voice continues. Sarah is 16 years old and a senior here at Lincoln High School, where she is the editor in chief of the school newspaper, a member of Pull and Scroll Honor Society and an on-air school reporter for radio station WDXY. Sarah will attend Morgan State College in the fall. When the voice stops, I begin my descent toward Butch, who is waiting at the bottom step. Applause fills the air. When Butch takes my left hand, I drop into a deep curtsy, holding it for as long as I can before straightening up and letting him lead me to my position in a semicircle beside the other girls. He stands behind me, close enough that I can feel his warm breath on my neck. When the last girl has been introduced and the lights in the gymnasium are turned up high, I search the audience for mama. I finally spot her at a table with friends. She's beaming. I smile in her direction, hoping that I've finally made her happy. When the band begins to play the Blue Danube, I turn toward Butch and we assume our dance position. As our line of dancers slowly circles a highly polished gym floor, in a clockwise direction, I'm dizzy with excitement. Butch holds me steady and I melt into his lead. I can almost feel everyone's eyes following us with approval as we float along on the music. It feels as if we're part of a perfect wheel moving in perfect form. A crystal ball showers a magnificent array of colors upon us. Tonight, the fact that we're colored doesn't matter. Tonight, I feel like a beautiful princess smiled upon and feted by people I respect and who respect me. Tonight, I'm more than just another poor little colored girl living in the shadows. Tonight, I'm filled with the infinite possibilities of who I can become. Hello, 
I'm Molly Peacock, and I am delighted and proud to have been associated with Kevin Carey Press since its beginning 20 years ago. Just the way Kevin Carey merges two Irish counties for its name, so its philosophy jubilantly combines passion with craft. Each Kevin Carey book in the last two decades values emotion. And all the secret sources of interior song that surprise us when we reach a wellspring. Kevin Carey prizes that personal voice, knowing what a radical act it can be, and also knowing that the personal voice is always the way to the universal. It was a zygote of an idea in the imagination of Joan Cusack Handler 20 years ago. And over these past two decades, it's evolved into the expansive, generous presence it has in contemporary American letters today. You know, there's been another important fusing, and that is that each poet and writer that Kevin Carey publishes has become part of the Kevin Carey family of authors. It's a splendid union of voice and magnificent design and line that makes the marvel of this press. Happy anniversary, Kevin Carey! Happy anniversary, Kevin Curry. I'm Harriet Levin, here to read my poem, Smoke, from my collection, My Oceanography. Smoke. If I could use smoke as a medium, I'd have no trouble creating great art. Strands of close scented smoke pull me in, layer by layer, amid the mesmerizing sound of rain hitting the roof, sidling off the windshield, and draining off the hood. I tilt my head back and imagine a cigarette pressed against my lover's lips. Three more left in the pack. This is the last of him. Smoke enters my mouth, passes through my throat and into my lungs where it infiltrates every cell in my bloodstream. I smoke past the red line on the tip, his body's imprint, jawline, nape, neck, and tuck the stub into my jeans pocket for his clove scent to seep through, linger, live in my pocket as a remnant as I pull open the car door, step forward and out of him. Hi everyone, I'm Shira Dents and I'm honored to be part of this Kevin Carey Press anniversary celebration. I'm going to be reading a poem from my hybrid memoir published by Kevin Carey Press, uh, Door of Thin Skins. Thank you. Circumflex. Back up, beginning with hugs, going nowhere to unstiffen me. A trampoline and have me embrace my father wrangling, less standoffishly, holding me down to his sitting beside me to kiss me because he was, when I don't want, so uncomfortable to be touched with my being. She screams, so uncomfortable, anger a splinter, and withdrawn, a girl with no sex, to sitting in his lap, his own flesh, to provide me, and blood, with a reparative, the zero at the center of an egg, nurture and experience. Nothing happening to kissing. 
dragonfly body, tongue kissing, transparent as its wings, to fondling, a dragonfly needle into the heart, my breasts, needle, eventually exposed. I wish I had a piano saying, you think, to portray the landscape. I'm doing this for you without hills, but really without mouths, I'm doing it for me. How the woodenness to the exasperated circumflex teepee fingering. She, the wooden dummy inside a shoe to see if she was put there to keep its shape wet. What do you call your father? Good evening. I am Jonathan Spinner, and having served on the board of Cabin Carry Press, I now serve as both the Director of Development and the board liaison. Our board is unusual among poetry presses because not only does it have local representation, but is national in scope and international in flavor. Its members provide a wide diversity of skills, experiences, and talents. Two people deserve special notice with their longtime leadership and support of the press. Carol Snyder is a retired human resources director for a major chemical company and lives in Connecticut. President of the board from 2012 to 2018, she now serves as president emeritus. Molly Peacock, whom you heard from, is a poet, essayist, short fiction writer, and biographer, she has taught at many universities and served as the president of the Poetry Society of America, where she began the Poetry in Motion program, which places poetry placards on subway cars and buses throughout American cities. Molly was a founding member of the board and president from 2004 to 2009, and now serves on the advisory council and as president emeritus. Let me now introduce our present board. Jose Angel Araguz is professor at Suffolk University in Lowell, Massachusetts, by way of New Mexico, New York, and Cincinnati. He is a published poet and critic and editor-in-chief of Salamander Magazine and the Instagram Poetry Project. You will soon meet the musical side of Phineas Eddy, a lyricist, theatrical producer, poet, critic, and professor of English at SUNY Stony Brook, and a resident of Brooklyn. Cornelius is a co-founder of Cavi Canum, a nonprofit organization serving Black poets of various backgrounds and acting as a safe space for intellectual engagement and critical debate. Alan Handler is the senior member of the board, for 30 years a resident of New Jersey before he was lured to Brooklyn by his grandchildren. A trained psychologist, Alan had a long relationship with the Sylvan Learning Centers. Lars Lichtenfeld, also from New Jersey by way of South Carolina, as a published author with extensive experience researching and writing on mental health issues for the military and government agencies and not-for-profit organizations. He teaches at Middlesex and Brookdale Community Colleges and Rowan University and serves as our outreach chair. J.D. Messenger is from Houston, Texas by way of the U.S. Naval Academy and Singapore. He is a five-time award-winning author, inspirational speaker, mentor, and founder of the Messenger Group which transforms leaders for the 21st century. JD is our strategies chair. Karen Stevenson is a Torontonian by way of Ontario, Canada. And besides being a hockey mom, is a consultant with over 15 years of analysis and relationship management experience in the network, hardware, telecom, finance, insurance, and community sectors. She serves as our resources chair. Christine Warnke is a lawyer living in Washington, DC and Greece. She is a senior vice president of Capitol Hill Consulting Group and represents clients on legislative, 
regulatory and international matters before the US Congress and the White House. She has been at the center of women's initiatives as a member of the Feminist Majority Future PAC Board, which supports state and local women candidates. Christine is our governance chair. Monica Use is a native New Yorker and an expert in retail operations. She has worked as manager of merchandising and sourcing at the Metropolitan Museum of Art with 13 years of global merchandising experience from her time at Brooks Brothers. Monica has been the chair of our 20th anniversary event committee and tonight is culmination of 18 months of her efforts. Now, please welcome the Cornelius Eddy Trio, followed by Monica Yus, who will give us special remarks. It's cloudy now, but it'll pass by. 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 Hello everyone, my name is Monica Use and I am a member of the Kevin Carey board. Um, I have been on the board for the last um, two years or so and um, 
I am a member of the Handler family. I am one of the few board members that doesn't really have a uh, writing or literary background. My background is for the most part in um, retail. Uh, but I have um, been lucky enough to witness um, the evolution of Cab and Carry over the last 20 years. From the time when it was um, an idea in Joan's mind and um, she pulled all the resources together that she could get um, to launch this incredible platform for not only herself as um, a writer, but also um, for so many uh, poets and writers within the community. Um, it has been such an incredible evolution and a gift to the community at large. Um, which is so different from any other presses that are out there. Um, it has been her incredible, incredible dedication to the arts, um, the community, and um, to literature at large that has just given her such a push to move forward given so many obstacles that have come up um, over the years in terms of fundraising, um, distribution, and so many other things that I have seen happen over the years. But the uh, perseverance and her ability to just pull people together and um, move forward is something that I am extremely proud of. Um, wishing you all well. Bye. Backyard Kingdom. All the way to heaven is heaven, St. Catherine of Siena supposedly said, and on most days, replete with the stabbed, shot, run over or into, the stroked, heart seized and cancer stricken, I'd say bullshit and be done with it. But today, at the tail end of April, the sun warming things up, I'm in shorts and a t-shirt, airing my body out in a backyard lounge chair, ready to emerge at last from winter's long gestation in flannels and sweaters. I'm listening to the nearby maples scratch an itch against the clabberts, and a downy woodpecker's got my foot tapping. I'm letting things go, deep breathing with a Phoebe's wheezy Phoebe. Game on now. Chickadees have changed their tune. It's all, hey, sweetie, hey, sweetie, in the shine and sheen of new leaves. A cardinal cranks up its engine, a catbird mews and whistles, and a morning dove responds to the earth's tilt with soft, insistent coos. When I shut my eyes, the wind DJs a mix of all these singular voices, and the delirium of their song won't take no for an answer. Take joy whenever you can get it, a wise old poet wrote. And how can I refuse this day that seems shaped for my delight, this luck of the drawer moment in the sun, the air rippling with a green iridescence? So I say, I do, I do, to the day's proposal, and let myself float on April's soft, warm air even my sweat-stained t-shirt like raiment. For now, my listening body, an ear that hears the kingdom always here. Hi everyone, and congratulations to Kevin Carey. I'm Maureen Seaton, and I'm going to be reading from my collection from 2019, Sweet World. And this poem is called Sweet World, but it's not going to spoil too much. Don't worry. Wonder what I'd be today if I was still married to my Wall Street husband, besides married to a Wall Street husband and puking gin in a silk sheath outside Delmonico's. I might be a size four. I might be a secret Democrat or a weekend lesbian. This morning, five planes flew over the yard in a V as I was about to dig into a pile of lavender pancakes al fresco. The V flew low and slow. It flew loud and ominous. 
It alarmed me, sounding a lot like the war movies of my 50s childhood. My cranky chihuahua was proverbially biting at flies, and I was sitting there not thinking about hate. Recently, I experienced life with cancer, an intoxicating time, richly infused with the liquor of death, but good too because no one expected much of me, and I was left to my own mind, which is what I'm missing most these days, unless that's it over there, screeching on two wheels around the racetrack. Today I typed Ganas instead of Song, and I wondered if it was some new app designed to mess with me. I've never thought to call the world sweet before. Surviving something can do that, make things taste different. Suddenly you're a heroine, all this devastation, and you're still standing in the middle of it. Hello, this is Joseph Olegaspi, and I would like to congratulate Kevin Carey for its 20th anniversary. And here's hoping for 20 more years. Congratulations. Uh, I'm reading a poem from my second collection uh, titled Threshold uh, from Kevin Carey Press. Um, the title of the poem is Chelsea Peters. Chelsea Piers. My lover and I stroll down the piers post pescatarian dinner in midsummer. He points to the moon veiled by clouds. The Hudson River murmurs soft waves. Across the buildings glitter like theater. Our arms damp Lamps lend themselves to fantasy of the last two men on earth. But as I reach for his hand, he pulls it away, looks hurriedly around. Suddenly, I stand awash in brutal history, periphery of sanctuary and danger. We are those punish for our affections. The silent seagulls disguise as larks. His denial plunges silver finned into the river. My name is Margot Taft-Stever and I'm honored to participate in the Cavan Carey Press 20th anniversary celebration. Amid the grim milestones we witnessed this year, it's a boost to one's spirit to finally have some good news. For any small or arts organization to live for 20 years is cause for celebration. But Cabin Carey Press is one noted for its aesthetic achievement, creative ideas, and valuation of community. So celebrating its 20th birthday is particularly significant. I remember how excited I was to have one of my poems on the possession of horses included in one of their first books, The Breath of Parted Lips, a stunning and ambitious two-part anthology of poems by a community of poets whose work was fostered by the Frost plays. I wanted to thank the whole Kevin Carey team for publishing my second full-length book, Crack Piano, which looks like this in 2019. It's mostly about the line between sanity and insanity told through the story of my great grandfather, Peter Ross and Taft, who spent some time in the Cincinnati private hospital for the insane in the late 1800s. But Crack Piano also contains many poems that question traditional conceptions of motherhood and highlight the subjugation of women. I will read Splitting Wood. It was the thought of his entering their infant's room that drove her. She remembered his face the first time she saw him. Now half gone from whiskey, eyes hooded like a hawk's, he said he'd kill the children when he woke. The neighbors heard it, the screams, they heard. His workman's hand, his gnarled hand dangled down. The knife lay by the bed. 
She slipped from the covers while he slept, placed her feet on the floorboards just so. The dogs barked outside, snapdragons, flowered tongues, and all the wired faces of the past strung up. The ax hung on the porch, woodpile nearby, each log plotted uneasily entwined. The children's tears were rain, tears were watering the parched hills. The wild moon foamed at the mouth, the wild moon crept softly at her feet. The arms that grabbed the ax were not her own, that hugged it to her heart while he slept were not hers the cold blade sinking in his skin. She grew up in the country splitting wood. She knew just how much it took to bring a limb down. Thank you. Hi, I'm Katie Porter. I am the author of The Body at a Loss published by Cabin Carey Press in 2019 under their Laurel Books imprint. And today I am here to read you a poem from that collection, Taking My Time. Woke up to the sound of rain, two eggs on toast and a cup of coffee, a cat napping on the news. In my robe on a Tuesday morning, the sound of the rain like typing on the lawn. The coughing starts early today, each hitch, each hiccup, a jolt. In an hour, I will be in the office of my GP, going over the radiology results. But for now, I can imagine the outcome any way I like, sunny side up. Early sounds of traffic were, tires splashing up, oily waves at the curb. I can still pretend that I have not already read the report. If I sit still and quiet, the coughing subsides. If I drink the coffee slowly, if I take care not to wake the children, in the kitchen, the dishes in a tipsy pile, each plate uncertain like each day. Thank you. Hi, I'm Gabriel Cleveland, managing editor for Cavan Carey Press and co-editor of the spectacular new anthology we're highlighting tonight, which you can order on our website now and which we are so thrilled and excited to share with each of you. This collection is not only the culmination of 16 months of extremely laborious work on Jones and my part, it is representative of the inception, production, and growth that our small but mighty press has undergone over the last two decades. Our guiding principle when picking one selection from each of the 104 books we've published thus far was to both encapsulate the experience of that particular work and to represent its place among the whole of Kevin Carey's library. The effect of this careful consideration is that much like how poems become greater than the sum of their parts when assembled with clear vision into a book, this anthology represents the spirit and personality of Kevin Carey Press as a whole. Here's our selection from the late Robert Cedar's memoir, To the Marrow, which details the trials and tribulations of his experience living with lymphoma and undergoing bone marrow transplants in the hope of recovery. As part of our Laurel Book series, his work reveals the lived experience of illness with all of its daily moments of darkness, reflection, and mercifully, light. This excerpt comes two days before his transplant. I'm still getting used to this place. This is my home. I can't tell you I'm claustrophobic or that I hate the place or this is even the last place in the world you'd want to be. There are worse places. You don't wanna be in Bosnia although you could survive that war and have no cancer. You don't wanna be on death row. 
You don't want to be living on the street, not in January in Boston, but you don't want to be here. We put up photos of the kids and some of Claire's drawings. I brought a few books, but have barely looked at them. I brought paper and pencils, but the tape recorder is all I can manage right now. I've asked friends to send snapshots of themselves instead of cards. They think I'm strange, but hey, you know, whatever you want, better you than me. You don't want to be here. The photos and drawings don't make me cry anymore. They've become wallpaper. All of these people on the outside going about their business, me in here, pisses me off. Jean's been the only visitor so far. They call, they complain about the weather. It snows, it's cold. They tell me I picked a good time to be indoors for a month. They tell me I'm better off inside. Bull, I am not well off. Or am I? I'm in a good hospital with people who know what they're doing and care, I couldn't be better. I have something my callers don't. I have a chance today and tomorrow and for the next however long it takes to fight the thing that could kill me. When I talked about death, people would respond with some version of, you know, any of us crossing the street could be hit by a bus. And I'd respond, yeah, but when I get to the other side of the street, I still have cancer. What I'm doing here is trying to let the bus hit the cancer, but to jump myself out of the way at the last second. Jump too soon, the cancer jumps with me. Jump too late. Later, they will come and take me back to the radiation chamber for my second dose and do the whole thing over again. They have to split up my dosage into six sessions over three days. One humongous dose would be too much for me all at once. Jump. I began my pursuit of an education and career in writing due to a deep need to understand how to communicate effectively with others. Where my spoken words failed, I was consistently able to bring my worldview to life in clear, relatable language through writing. This was my lifeline in an existence that felt otherwise isolating and inarticulable. Imagine my surprise and joy when I discovered Calvin Carey Press, a publisher of books that meet its ethos of lives brought to life. In my capacity as managing editor, I work closely with all of our authors, each of whom subscribes to a similar viewpoint of the importance and power of sharing life experiences through clear, powerful writing. It is extremely gratifying to be among peers creating work that cuts through the silence and seeking to build a bridge between themselves and their readers. In order to turn their manuscripts into finished books, I shepherd them through each stage of the production process in which I coordinate with Baron Wormser, who you'll hear shortly, who content edits each book to draw out its strength and potential while staying true to the author's vision. Joy Arbor, who copy edits each book for clarity, grammar, and consistency of style. Ryan Scheif, our designer, Mayfly Design, who encapsulates the literary artistry of each book with equal visual artistry by creating stunning covers and inviting interiors. McNaughton and Gunn for bringing our books into the physical realm with superior printing services. The Chicago Distribution Center, which gets our books into bookstores across the country. And of course, the wonderful Joan Handler, who provides expert advice, direction, and ideas at every stage of the process. It's been a pleasure and a privilege to work daily on projects that I deeply believe in 
and nothing beats the experience of cracking open a carton of new books for the first time and seeing all the hard work come to fruition. Except maybe when I get to send those books to eager readers like yourself when the orders come pouring in because I manage our website order fulfillment as well. And I can't wait to ship you your copy of this spectacular anthology, which you can order right now. Now we'll have a word from Baron Wormser, former poet laureate of Maine, memoirist, founder of the Frost Place Conference on Poetry and Teaching, and our content editor extraordinaire, after which, in new Cavan Carey tradition, we'll have a miniature online reading featuring our 2020 collection. Thank you. My name is Karen Chase. I met Joan Handler, the founder of Cabin Carey Press in the late 1990s in the mountains of New Hampshire. We were both teaching at the Robert Frost place that summer. We became really good friends. It was the era at the Frost place of it was a great time. It was the era of Baron Wormser and Jack Weiler, people who later became involved with Cavan Carey. Joan and I would talk about how neither of us had books out yet, but we were both doing okay in the poetry world. For God's sakes, I had published in the New Yorker, but no books. So one day Joan said, I have an idea, I'll start a press and we'll publish all of us. So I thought that was a really good idea. And um, Cavan Carey Press was born 20 years ago. My book, Casimir Square, was the second book that came out. That was in 2000. Joan said to me when we were preparing the book for publication, who would you like to write blurbs for you? And I said, Billy Collins, Andre Kudrescu. And she said, well, I'll try. And lo and behold, they did. In 2008, Kevin Carey published my second book of poetry, Bear. I love Cabin Carey Press. It's, I love Joan. They're both living organic beings who grow and change and plunge into the future. Cabin Carey has always embodied so much honesty and passion for poetry, enthusiasm, and authenticity. I think authenticity is really the main thing or the thing that I treasure more than anything. And Joan has now chosen two young men who embody these qualities and Gabriel Cleveland and Dimitri Reyes. And they are carrying this extraordinary press into the future. What more could you want? Happy birthday, Cabin Carey Press. You're 20 years old. Hi, I'm January Gill O'Neill, and I want to wish Cabin Carey congratulations on their 20th anniversary in publishing. Here's to the next 20. I'd like to read a poem also uh, from my book, Rewilding, and it's called Kettling. The low winter sun made driving difficult. To look down, the black asphalt blurred my eyes, so for a few moments I looked away, studying the rock ridges and cliffs carved out of cragged earth, the marshy fields of Phragmites, their silken heads standing sword-like in the steady wind. Above, a kettle of vultures soared on the thermals, shadows flying in upright spirals, you can't understand in that moment how I yearned to be free, free of the body and all its fog, untouchable under the whisper of heaven, rising and falling under my own power, a current 
running in me and through me, a whim of wind, a miracle. I followed the span of wings until I had seen enough, until the long vine of highway called me back to this world, said, keep going. Keep going, Kevin Carey. Congratulations. Hi, I'm Mark Nepo, and it's a joy to be part of this celebration of the 20th anniversary of Kevin Carey Press. I am very grateful to be a Kevin Carey author, and my thanks and admiration to Joan and everyone who has made this vision a reality and brought so many voices into the world. So I'd like to share my poem, The Edge, which is from my Kevin Carey title, Surviving Has Made Me Crazy. The Edge. They had traveled a long way, each from a beginning the others couldn't imagine. When they reached the edge, they all peered deeply as far as they could. Almost at once they gasped and held on to each other. Then one declared, I knew it, beyond there is nothing. Another countered, for me it holds everything. By now the fearful one fretted, I knew I should never have come. Dizzied by the view he retreated, I must go back. Finally, the blind one poked his way to the edge and after a while sighed, it's as I've always known. It was too late to travel down and so they were forced to listen to each other through the night. The blind one began, what will you bring back? The one who saw nothing said that where we are is all there is, that's what I'll say. The one who saw everything smiled and said, I'll bear witness that we are cradled by something incomprehensible. At this, the fearful one jumped in. Well, my advice will be to just stay put. In the silence that followed, they asked the blind one who confessed, I'm not going back. And one thing this poem has taught me is that we carry these voices within us, the one who sees nothing, the one who sees everything, the fearful one and the blind one who somehow knows the foundational truth under all our trouble. And it's our job to listen to all those voices and negotiate them. Again, congratulations to Kevin Carey for this remarkable, remarkable journey and and so glad to be a part of it. Hi, I'm Franny Lindsay, and I'm going to be reading a poem to you from my sixth book, which Kevin Carey released this past fall. Um, the name of the poem is Bead. Bead. I still have the shirt. He wore to the doctor the day she took both his hands and looked into his milky eyes and told him as if it were some kind of blessing. None of us cried, none of that. Instead, we sat in an awkward huddle and skimmed the scan report, all seven single-spaced pages, making no sense, especially to him who swore to God that a life was a string of beads made of single bright days, and all you needed to do to be happy was thread them. Now and then hold your strand up to whatever light there was but always keep a firm grip on the bead you were passing your red string through that very moment. Then go back to your stringing and go back again until they were gone.
the communicants. Here, Tuesday stumbling towards midnight, we're stuck with that lone couple lingering over a last swallow of Pinot. Their plates cleared, water glasses emptied, check unsettled. They don't care that the closing cook has swept and mopped his now dark kitchen, where the dish machine cools among bottles of bleach, or that last call was given long ago. Instead, they lean in and whisper while we sip water and try not to stare, soaking up the flicker of a muted TV, feeling forgotten like those doggy bags we pack that get left behind. And if work can be worship, it finds us supplicant and waiting for the chirp of chairs pushing back from their table, followed by heels clicking on hard wood, a recessional marking the end of service, the front door closing like a prayer, quiet on its hinges. My name is Baron Wormser. I work as an editor for Calvert Carey Press. I have been connected with the press since the inception of the press one way or another, which is to say I've been published by Calvert Carey, two books of poetry and a book of short stories called The Poetry Life and have been on the board of Calvert Carey and as I say, go back to the inception of the press when it was sort of a glimmer in uh, Joan Handler's eyes. It's been a great honor to be connected with the press over the, over the years. I think Kevin Carey's commitment to uh, poetry that focuses so much on people and uh, different lives that uh, are portrayed in the many books that Kevin Carey has done um, has been an, a remarkably honorable enterprise. And my task now with the press, as I say, is when a book comes to Kevin Carey, I look it over, uh, read through it a couple times, uh, make some su suggestions, uh, have some back and forth typically with the poet uh, about about the book. Uh, a great deal goes into putting together the final uh, product that is, uh, is a book of poetry. The sequence of the poems, which poems go in, which poems don't go in, uh, and of course the individual poems themselves in terms of any any little hiccups um, that might be there in, in terms of the uh, the poems themselves. Uh, for my part, I've been um, pleased to do these books with Cabot Carey over the over the years. Um, my most recent book is Unidentified Side Objects, uh, which came out a couple years ago, and I'm going to read a read a final poem in the book, which is called Leaving. Not to be here anymore, not to hear the cat's fat purring, not to smell wood smoke, wet dog, cheap cologne, good cologne, not to see the sun and stars, oaks and asters, snow and rain, every form I take mostly for granted makes me sad. But pleased to be writing down these words, pleased to have been one more who got the chance to participate, who raised his hand, although he didn't know the answer or understand the question. No matter, the leaving makes me sad. So much was offered so freely and completely. Thank you. I'm Rachel Haddis. I think of Cabin Carey Press as being like an old friend. You can't remember exactly when or how you met, but you were very grateful to have in your life. In the late spring of 2011, Joan Cusack Handler graciously invited me to edit the second edition of the Waiting Room Reader Poetry Anthology, and I'm holding it up right here. 
there's a cat. This turned out to be a very pleasurable task, which I completed during a challenging time in my own life. I will read one paragraph from my editor's note. This book, the second in the Waiting Room Reader series, grows from the belief of its visionary originators, Joan Cusack Handler, publisher of Cabin Carey Press, and Sandra Gold, president of the Arnold P. Gold Foundation for Humanism and Medicine, that one good thing to be able to pay attention to in waiting rooms is poetry. This is a belief that I, as guest editor of this volume, emphatically share. Poems with staying power are always themselves arcs of attentiveness, and reading any good poem both demands and rewards attention. The job then is to make sure poems can be found in waiting rooms where they will always be needed. In soliciting work for this book, a book which is intended to find its way into the hands of many people in many waiting rooms, I wasn't after uplift or consolation. I sought poems whose focused engagement might hook the reader, who once drawn in might just lose herself in the poem. The generosity and imagination of Joan and the Cabin Carey Press team has always held a spot in my heart. Now, during this time of, forced, of enforced isolation, the work of books like The Waiting Room Reader feels more crucial and relevant and more needed than ever. Even the most crowded waiting rooms have always been places of isolation. It was the genius of Cabin Carey Press to bring poetry to this lonely crowd. I'd like to end by sending a little shout out to my former MFA poetry student, Dimitri Reyes, who is now marketing and communications director of Cabin Carey Press to his and their good fortune. I think Cabin Carey has a knack for attract attracting young local talent. One more reason to thank Cabin Carey Press for the wonderful kinds, many wonderful kinds of work that you do. That was so nice. Thank you, Rachel. And again, thank you everyone for being here so far. Thank you for your patience and your care and your attention to everything arts. I'm going to make my piece fairly short uh, before we enter our last big movement. Um, but really I am humbled by everything I've heard so far. Uh, and it's so amazing to be virtually surrounded by uh, teachers and colleagues and friends, old and, and newly made. This is the greatest thing about the poetry world, like how large it is, yet we are so interconnected, even more so during this time in our history. That's what drew me into Cabin Carey Press. I couldn't ask for a better title as marketing and communications director of New Jersey's most established press as well. Uh, although I can sound, I could say that this sounds like a dream for anyone interested in a writing career, the title doesn't really give justice to the satisfaction I get from working with all the authors, especially on a project like this. Um, in the name marketing and communications, my work is bringing our writers to the open market and communicating, working with them to help share their work with the general public, a base commitment of Cabin Carry, giving writers access uh, and access to general readerships everywhere, which is what every writer wants at the end of the day, right? As Afa said earlier, uh, this reaches beyond buzzwords like campaigns and sales and marketability. Although these are pieces that make up the lifeblood DNA that's publishing, there is more to this art uh, that we produce and peruse and pursue as our artistic selves, like love and pain and obsession and humanity. What it really means for us to be human and to collaborate and share those ideas is why I'm here. And I'm glad to be in a space where my colleagues feel the same way. And it is expressed consistently through the literature that we continue to produce. Like this poem, for instance, Elegy. My father knew we were afraid and he was also afraid. So that night after dinner, he brought a chair from the kitchen, put a shotgun across his lap and rocked back and forth. And it was cold because the sun went down early and the blackness of the woods around us made the world seem still. And I felt like a young boy that everything was going to last forever because my father was outside our house ready to fight to protect myself, my mother and younger brother. I have wondered why I have not heard much about men like my father instead of those songs that sing, why do you treat me so? 
My father was not a good man, seldom home and mean to my mother and short tempered with his sons. But he was that night, the father I remembered sitting on the porch because he heard a Negro had talked back to some white man in town. This was by the late Sam Cornish. And as we celebrate this evening, it's also important to realize that even our writers that are no longer with us are still with us, forever a part of our ever growing and changing Cabin Carry Press community. I'm so happy and blessed to have this opportunity to keep these memories alive while making new ones with all we are in contact with. So now that's the time of the evening where we've arrived basically to the end. We're at our final movement. Thanks everyone for hanging out with us. Uh, please purchase the anthology. It spans our 20 years of our literary excellence and continue to advocate for yourselves, advocate for writing, and you'll hear the rest of the testimonies. But first, I wanted to introduce the Cornelius E. Trio and more wonderful poetry. Thank you. Hi. I'm Joan Seliger Sidney. Although my book, Body of Diminishing Motion, Poems and a Memoir, was published in 2005 as Kevin Carey's second Laurel Book title, The Literature of Illness imprint, it still looks fresh and beautiful. In those days, Kevin Carey was the rare press that would publish a multi-genre book, a trend setter. Body of Diminishing Motion went on to become an Eric Hoffer finalist. Here's how it looks with its gorgeous cover by Joan Cusick Handler's cousin. After considering other possible covers, Joan realized this painting on her wall was perfect. I also want to stress the importance of Kevin Carey Press's commitment to publish literature by disabled voices. Here's an example of one of my poems about my long life with multiple sclerosis. Also, my long life as a swimmer. These days, as long as our community center is open, I'm swimming half a mile, 18 laps back and forth, uh, almost every day. And this poem is about laps. In this marriage of water and air, always she is the beginner, teaching her hands and arms to push away the water, to raise her head to breathe. Though she swims her laps, butterflying up and back, trying to kick loose her leg muscles, the hamstring spasm. Then left foot crosses right, forces her to invent a one-legged way to swim. No more can she hoist her body out of the pool or climb the metal stairs. Instead, she sits in the hydraulic chair, waits for someone to flick the switch. Immobile in air, gravity reclaims her. In the locker room, there's always a woman to pull up her panties, stretch slacks, socks. After years of early bird swims, they know each other's bodies, wrinkling skin, diminishing limbs. Nothing holds them back. Thanks. Hi, my name's uh, Jack Riddle, and uh, this is uh, my book that the wonderful folks at Cabin Carey were willing to publish. It's called Losing Season. It follows a high school basketball team in a little town uh, through a long winter and a long losing season. There's not a game in the book. It's all behind the scenes because I grew up behind the scenes. My father was 
the basketball coach first at Westminster College, Division Three, and then in Division One at the University of Pittsburgh, where he was the head basketball coach. And I'm going to read a poem called Coach and Effigy. Coach and Effigy. His daughter saw him first, hanging from the maple that draped its old arms over the house, his head blooming from the rope that strangled his neck. In the morning's moonlight, she read their name, scrawled like a scar across his chest. She remembered the way his hands had held her. Years ago, when bloodied from a fall, she'd let the scream we all carry go to him. He seemed to hold it in his hands. Now, within this losing season, she wants to take this anonymous lynching in her arms, ask the hands that made it and the fists that rose against it to join, stand around her as she sings the only song, lets the head rest, lets the heart give out. I am thrilled to join the celebration to honor the team and community of Cavan Carey Press for your 20 years of service and excellence. My name is Portia Hardy and I am the program officer with the New Jersey State Council on the Arts and state director of the New Jersey Poetry Out Loud program, a national high school poetry recitation competition in partnership with the National Endowment for the Arts, the Poetry Foundation, and state arts agencies across the country. For almost a decade, Cavan Carey Press has been an invaluable sponsor for the NJPOL program, elevating the experience for students and their teachers by investing in deepening their understanding of the written verse and sharing their wealth of outstanding poets with the NJPOL community. Through the Cavan Carey Gift Books program, Participants build their personal and in-school poetry library and their sponsorship of teachers' participation in the Frost Place Poetry Conference has created the space for New Jersey educators to express their aspirations that they have for themselves and their students. Thank you for your continued support of the New Jersey Poetry Out Loud program and making up this community where teenagers can show up as the best version of themselves. Congratulations, Cabin Carey Press. Come here, she said. I'll teach you a poem. Play the one about the handsome man and woman standing on the steps of her apartment. My heart is that black violin. Played slowly. Approach your grief with determination. Nuns fret not at their convent's narrow room. If they come for you, they come for me. Today in America, not soul. Into the valley of death, road the 600. Today, we woke up to a revolution of snow. To love and let go again and again. No life tread silently but clouds and cloudy shadows wander free. Higher and higher, he lies above me in a blue light. And who is to say there is more of a reason or more to love? Good afternoon. My name is Mary Ann Miller, and I teach in the English department at Caldwell University in Caldwell, New Jersey, not too many miles down the road from Cabin Carey's home base. I am very happy to have been invited to read with you today so that I could express publicly my gratitude to Cabin Carey 
not only for their beautiful books, but for their commitment to engaging their authors in service to the wider educational community in Northern New Jersey. For the last 12 years, students who choose a service learning option in my Introduction to Poetry course have learned a great deal about poetry, both reading and writing it, from working in small groups with Cavan Carey Poets. When COVID hit in the middle of our spring 2020 semester, Dimitri and Gabriel graciously helped me make a quick shift from my usual project of hosting a public reading for three authors to engaging about a dozen Cavan Carey Poets divided into three virtual readings. After these readings, my students each posted a customer review on amazon.com for one of the 12 poets books. But the poets really served us more than we served them. Over the years, students have been repeatedly impressed by how supportive Cabin Carey authors are of one another. Thank you, Cabin Carey, for teaching my students the value of community. So I'm here uh, this afternoon to read a poem by Peggy Penn. Um, it's from her first poetry collection uh, entitled So Close, published by Cabin Carey in 2001. And the title of the poem is May Evening. Some of us trim the lawn. Some of us look for our wallet. Some of us wipe the dishes. Some of us walk the dog. Some of us have a bone scan. Some of us yawn and check our watches. Some of us have radiation for the second time. In the cities, May blossoms fall on concrete sidewalks, wondering what's the next step. On a day I remember, warm then as now, a day like body temperature, a forlorn wind stirred the leaves, buds still tight and white green. I heard a car door slam. They are going somewhere without me, a punishment. I am going somewhere too, sitting in my window and never coming back. Thank you. Change. Everything gonna change. 
Everybody look different, but I feel the same. Everything ain't gonna change. Everything ain't gonna change. Everything ain't gonna change. Everything ain't gonna hurt change. My old man had the blues. I got up now. My mama had the blues. I got up now. Greetings from Sarasota, Florida. I'm Teresa Carson. I'm grateful to Kevin Perry Press for publishing my first two collections of poetry, Elegy for the Floater and My Crooked House. Also, I was its associate publisher from 2010 to 2016. Today, I'll be remembering two important members of the Kevin Perry community who are no longer with us, Florence Eisman and Jack Wilder. Let me tell you a few things about Florence. During three of my six years as associate publisher, I worked alongside the amazing Florence Eisman, who had co-founded the press with Joan and was its managing editor from its inception until her death in 2013. How can I describe her? Hmm, sharp, organized, kind, a fan of animated movies, quirkily funny, generous, and oh, she always wore bright red lipstick. During her 13-year tenure, Florence shepherded 70 titles from manuscript to book, and the writers loved her. Whenever Joan and I went to industry events, 
writers would come up to the table, not to meet Joan, not to meet me, only because they wanted to meet Florence. What most people don't know is that she was also a poet. Here's a poem email she wrote after reading an early version of my second collection. Hi, T. Tomorrow is another day scheduled for a needle in my arm, not for a high, but for a poison that heals damages simultaneously and diminishes the real me. I want to read your words while I'm alert and in tune. So I aim for the park with my crooked house under my still undisturbed arm. Tweety bird, no way is that the person that came to live in a crooked house. Let me tell you who you resembled for years, even before we met, a baby wood duck. I learned about you from a documentary, of course, PBS TV. The males are magnificent. I saw one for a split second years ago and his colors are engraved on my brain. What is even more brain shattering is that wood ducks nest high up, really high in the tree, really high. You wouldn't believe how high, in a hole, in a tree. Mama duck leaves the nest as soon as the eggs start to crack and goes a short distance away. And in a few days, starts calling her babies in a soft, warbling tone. One baby wood duck approaches the edge of the hole. Let me anthropomorphize for a moment. Baby wood duck knows he's too young to fly, but he also knows he damn well better get out of that hole 20 feet high to survive. Baby wood duck steps over the hole's rim and drops to earth from 20 feet, alive on the earth. T, your work is brave, brave, alive, full of risk, leaving me on a high. Yours truly. I think that should give you an idea of who Florence was. Joan wanted to honor her memory in a meaningful way. We ran through many ideas before realizing the answer was in front of our faces. Kevin Carey already had a commitment to publish one book per year by a New Jersey writer. Florence had lived in New Jersey for most of her adult life. Why not dedicate that book to her? Thus, the Florence Eisman Memorial Collection was initiated in 2017 with Tina Kelly's A Bloom and a Rye. Now, switching gears to that force of nature, Jack Weiler. Tomorrow would have been his 69th birthday. In 2006, Kevin Carey published his second collection, Fun Being Me. Then, after his death in 2009, the CKP community pulled together to prepare for publication his posthumous collection, Divina is Divina. Fellow Kevin Carey author Danny Schott and I were given the gift of making the final decisions for our dear friend's important book. The best way I know to describe Jack to people is to read one of his poems to them. So here's the title poem from Divina is Divina. Divina is Divina. My beloved had a friend. My beloved is Joanna. Her friend is Divina. Of course, my beloved's real name is Marco and a friend's real name is Hector. My beloved brought Divina to my home. She spoke no English. I spoke no Spanish. Of course, I spoke a little Spanish and Divina tried a little English. My beloved and I have two dogs. Davina loved our dogs and took them out. When she came to visit, she would stand outside and cry, Joanna, and inside the dogs would cry. My beloved's friend Davina died, not suddenly, not prettily, not like anyone should die. She died in a hospital in the city of New York and no one knew her name. She was Hector Gomez, 
She had no family. She lay quiet and still and faded into the world. No one in the hospital knew Davina. If we had stood outside and shouted her name, they would have walked us to the side and asked us to leave. They wouldn't have been jumping up with joy to hear our cry, like my dogs, like Joanna, like me. So my beloved's friend met her end alone in a city hospital with no dogs prancing around her, no flowers blooming, even though it was spring. You could say, and you should, what the fuck is this? You could be angry and you should. What kind of world tosses humans in the trash? But that would be like asking why the leaves blow in the fall. It would be like asking why flowers wilt in hot sun. It would be like asking why Hector is Divina. Hector is Divina because the flowers bloom. Hector is Divina because the sun rises. Hector is Divina because she is, because we are, because the sun is, because we die, because, because. Hector is Divina because we need to hear someone outside our door crying our names. Divina is Divina. I think that poem should give you an idea of who Jack was. So although they are not here to celebrate with us, Florence and Jack will always be members of the Catherine Carey community. Happy 20th, Kevin Carey Press. I hope there will be many more years and many more books in your future. I was born Anna Eleanor Roosevelt, called Eleanor after my father, Elliot. My daughter is Anna Eleanor called Anna. Her daughter, my granddaughter, bears our name as well, only we call her Sisty. Anna Eleanor Roosevelt is the name I bore until I married Franklin and added a second field of roses from the Dutch to my name. Soon I will be name only, Anna Eleanor Roosevelt Roosevelt. Anna after my mother who died at 29, Eleanor after my father who died at 34, Field of Roses, Field of Roses, a name to be carved in stone, yet a vision if you will see it, one field of roses followed by another. Hi, I'm Celia Bland, and I'm honored to be included in this uh, anniversary celebration for Kevin Carey. I will be eternally grateful to Joan Handler and to Kevin Carey for publishing my first collection, Soft Box, in this very beautiful edition. Um, my, my poem is called Maternity. It was written in the early 2000s, and uh, it was inspired by the life of Anna Akhmanova, who had been a very popular poet before the Russian Revolution and was persecuted after the revolution. Her husband was killed, her son was imprisoned, and I was reading about how she waited outside the prison with food for um, for her son, um, amongst all the other mothers. and. Um, which is something she writes about in one of her poems, and it's something that has inspired a number of poems um, by women poets. Um, but this is my perspective. Maternity. Akmanova writing odes to plows to free her son. I know that surrender now, that betrayal of self and art, those long waits outside the prison gates in snow. It is terrible to love. 
It was not the baby, but the child repeating my vowels, curses, verbs indiscriminately, playing his toys along my legs and stomach as if I were only landscape. Thank you. Happy anniversary. Happy 20th to the press. Glad to be here. My name is Paola Corso, and I'm going to be reading a poem from my collection, The Laundress Catches Her Breath, and the poem is titled Step by Step with the Laundress. One, it's easier to wash clean clothes if wearing clean clothes, a saying adapted from your college-educated uncle who says, it's easier to find a job if you have a job when he hears you chewed out stuff in the park. Two, sort clothes in neat piles on the basement floor beside the safe where your father, Mr. Twenty Horns, stashes company photos from meal picnics and prayer cards for every deceased member of the family, alphabetized. By Saint. Three, check pockets for matches, lighters, cigarettes left from break, a string of beads Uncle bought for job interviews, but you wore to bar bingo and stuffed in a pocket because it felt like bugs around your neck. Four, load the washer, set the dowel, and pour in double the detergent, knowing Old man 20 horns waters it down since you told him to either stop buying the cheap ass Giant Eagle brand or you'd quit doing his laundry. Five, as soon as the clothes are submerged in soapy water, have a cigarette and listen to Tom Jones until the line, whoa, 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 she's a lady, or your butt burns out whichever comes first. Six, when the load begins to agitate, drink your coffee on the porch beside your grandmother's scrub board that 20 horns will make you use if his water bill gets any higher from trying to get meal soot out of his uniform and the soap of the day off of yours. Seven, hang a taut line Keep a clothespin in your mouth as if smoking a cigarette while your work friend Donna finishes your hoagie because her daughter ate hers and you gave yours up for adoption. Eight, group clothes and hang together, except don't put your 36D Hooter holders next to Donna's 32 AAA because you know who will figure out you've been washing her clothes since she got fired and kick your ass all the way to the laundromat. Nine, have a cigarette on the porch while the clothes dry, then check on your dying uncle next door as soon as your father stops yelling about you getting another pay cut so you'll never get the hell out of his house. 10. Get rid of the wasp nest near the line because 20 horns is too cheap to hire an exterminator and says you'll blow them away with your smoker's cough. Tell them smoking like a chimney isn't as bad as him smoking what a stack at the mill belches out, so he'll get the cancer, not you. 11. Take clothes down from the line then see if you can go offer to change your uncle's pillowcase next door because it's moist from his shallow breath and you suddenly need him to see you wearing the beads he gave you, if he remembers why. Twelve. Fold the clothes out of respect for your uncle Plan to wear a clean uniform from the basket if you need to visit the funeral home someday soon. Then go straight to work rather than call in sick. You want to believe what he told you. Thank you.
Allison, I felt bad today for telling you that Kanye's Bound 2 was the worst song I ever heard. You said you really liked it and said no more than that, though I know you were annoyed. I went home and listened to it again and again and again, three times. I didn't watch the video, I just listened. I still don't love it, but I don't hate it either. I realized being young or not too old means listening with fresh ears, being able to hear the beauty or truth that someone else can hear. Somehow I forgot that. Thanks for the reminder, Danny. My name is Danny Schott, and that poem is from my book Works, which was published by Kevin Carey in 2018. I'd like to congratulate Kevin Carey Press and Joan Cusack Handler in particular for 20 years of excellence in the publishing field. Also, congratulations to the hardworking, conscientious staff who continuously puts out excellent products. 20 years is no small thing. As a matter of fact, it's a grand achievement. Congratulations to Kevin Carey Press. Today, Cameron stayed home sick, and I'm surprised. He's almost never sick, and he loves school so much. It feels weird to walk to school without him, but Katie and I go together, holding hands through the alley, and I walk her to her class, like always, before heading to my classroom. She sometimes doesn't want me to leave, and I hate leaving too. The kindergarten classroom's the cheeriest room in the whole school, with lots of art and small round tables with boxes of scissors and crayons in the middle. But I'm a good kid, so I kiss her on the top of her head and remind her that mom is coming to get her at lunchtime and trek upstairs to my classroom with its rows of desks facing the chalkboard. Walking home by myself feels odd, but at least it isn't far. I hope Cam is feeling good enough to play outside after school because it's warm today. When I get to the end of the alley, I can see our big yellow house down the block on the other side of the street, and there's a white van in the driveway with the engine chugging. If I squint, I can see it says Holt Adoption Services on it, and my heart leaps. Are we getting another brother or sister today? Is that why Cam stayed home? To help welcome the new kid? I stop to look for cars before I cross the street, and I see the front door open. Cameron is standing there with a suitcase in his hand just looking at his feet. A lady comes up the steps and puts her hand on his back to lead him to the van. And before I can get across the street and down the block, he is inside and the van is backing out of the driveway. I run up the front steps to holler at mom, but change my mind and look back at Cam in the van. I stop at the top of the porch and turn around, holding my breath, my hand on the black iron railing. Cameron looks out the window at me, one of his hands on the glass, and I think he feels like I do, confused and stuck and drowning. I look at him like I'm looking in a mirror, my mouth open and my eyes huge. The smoke from the back of the van curls up past his window, and the van drives down the steep hill away from our house. There's a thick ball in my throat and I sit down hard, my backpack thumping behind me. The front door is still open, but nobody is there. I sit there for a long time until I hear mommy calling me from the kitchen to come in and shut the door. I walk slowly up the stairs to the top floor and peek in the boy's bedroom. Chris isn't home from school yet. Cam's bed is made just like always but his dresser drawers are empty and his soccer ball isn't there. He isn't sick. He's gone. Hi, I'm Dee Dee Goldenhar, a longtime friend of Joan Handler and Kevin Carey Press. And this is an origin story it's sometime in the mid to late 1990s, and I'm visiting Joan and Alan at their house in East Hampton. Joan and I know each other through Karen Chase and Howard Levy, 
poets we've taught with at the Frost Place in Franconia, New Hampshire. I love being around Joan and Alan, tall, handsome, larger than life, big hearted. Everything around them is larger than life. Their tall kitchen counters, the ladles and whisks oversized hanging from the ceiling, the masses of lovely cheeses and meats for lunch. Afterwards, Joan and I sprawl among pillows in a large pink room. And Joan starts dreaming aloud about a literary press. With her huge appetite, her passion for poetry, and her what the hell attitude. Why not publish poets whose work we love? Why not keep poets in print into their second and third books and beyond? Why not get poetry to people beyond the inner circles and ivory towers? Why not? How hard can it be? By the close of that afternoon, we've really imagined this cultural treasure, beautifully designed books by wonderful poets. We'll store the stock in the East Hampton garage. The only thing we haven't figured out is how will we get the books to the people and the people to the books? In other words, not just printing books, but publishing. I was then so blessed to serve on Joan's first board when it was that Cavan Carey Press slowly then quickly emerged as a literary institution and as a beloved community of poets, readers, and even healthcare workers because of Joan Handler. Joan, I bow to you as poet, editor, and especially as a visionary publisher of Cavan Carey Press. Bravo on your 20th year with much love. Wow, if I could just have all of the panelists just like clap it up and try to fill in the entirety of everyone's living room or office right now. Thank you, thank you, thank you for hanging in there the entire time. Thank you for being with us so much. There's so much I'm gracious for, but I don't want to be the one uh, to express that. I would really want to save this last moment for Joan, uh, just as a moment of reflection. And Joan, this is this is everything that you've done. This is this is your work. This is your baby, and I'd love to hear your final words about it. I'm amazed. <laughs> I'm humbled. I'm. Um... I feel exhilarated. Um, I can't. I, I can't find the words to really express how how deeply I have felt this entire performance, this entire party, um, the, the 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 poems, the. And the fact that people made their own videos. They, and I'm one of those people who's very frightened if you say, make a video. Um, so I'm in awe of all of you who did that. Um, and just the generosity of your work, the generosity of your comments, um, this incredible sense of community that I get from this afternoon and there I can't think of any greater tribute to Kevin Kerry than the one that you have put together for all of us this afternoon. I am so so grateful for all of you for everything that you have done for Kevin Carey, for everything that you have done for me and for our staff. There is, I have a magical staff now. I have, I don't worry about Kevin Carey anymore. I used to worry about Kevin Carey all the time. 
I don't worry about it anymore. I am absolutely filled to the brim with thanks and I'm about two seconds away from bursting into tears. Thank you so, so much. I love you. I love you. I love you. Thank you. Okay, everyone. Well, that just about wraps up our evening. Thanks for joining us. Um, as always, you will see us on YouTube. You will see us on our socials. Please join our newsletter. Uh, Elena, for one last time, if you haven't already in the Q&A, box if you could drop all the appropriate links. Uh, thank you for everyone on Facebook. We saw folks commenting on Facebook and you can also expect this to be on YouTube soon. Thank you all. Enjoy your evening. Bless you. <laughs>